Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cal, and I'm excited to welcome you today to the sixth edition of the Growth and Resiliency Speaker Series, which is brought to you by Mount Royal University's Growth Catalyst Program, where we help ambitious companies scale in partnership with Alberta Innovates, the province's innovation engine. The series has been curated to empower small and medium-sized enterprises in Alberta to build resiliency and catalyze growth during what has been a unique and challenging timeline. For today's event, I'm excited to introduce Lance Mortlock, stra Senior Strategy Partner at EY, and the author of the soon-to-be-published book, Disaster Proof Scenario Planning for a Post-Pandemic Future. Over the next hour, Lance is going to share insights from his book on how leaders are adapting their operating models to excel in unpredictable environments. So with that, please join me in welcoming Lance. Thank you, uh, Count, for that warm introduction there. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, to you uh, and to Professor Simon Rabbi for allowing me to present some insights from my book uh, today with the audience. Um, secondly, I, I wanted to thank MRU, Alberta Innovates, Growth Catalyst, and all the sponsors uh, for what uh, hopefully will be a good discussion, a good dialogue, and 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 I aim to share some valuable insights. I think. In terms of in terms of my book and and my research that I've been working on over the last couple of years, so with that, um, let me just maybe start by framing um, a little bit about um, my background. So I'm a senior strategy partner with EY, and I've worked over the last twenty years with um, a series of companies all over the world. Uh, I've had the fortune of living and working in eleven countries advised more than 60 organizations on, uh, on more than 150 projects. And, and during that, that period of time and that experience, I've had the, the opportunity to work with um, leadership teams on thinking about the future and thinking about uh, scenario planning in particular. Um, in terms of more specifically, I spend a lot of time with, with my team at EY and with um, with the Haskain School of Business, thinking about emerging trends and market dynamics. And as an author, I've worked with uh, a whole host of teams on different points of view uh, in the Canadian business environment. I'm also a visiting professor uh, and, and believe uh, that a strong uh, university system in our city here in Calgary uh, is important for uh, the vibrance of the business community. And finally, as a strategist, uh, I really enjoy uh, working and advising uh, a whole host of companies on their most strategic issues. So you might ask yourself the question, like, well, why did I write this book and, and, and why now? A couple of reasons. I think firstly, particularly in the energy sector, which dominates the Alberta landscape, we've seen a two-sided economic shock earlier in 2020. You know, we saw um, su supply side issues uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the oil and gas market, as well as demand side uh, issues, and the implications of OPEC and the Russians and the Saudi and the, influ and the influence that they had on the market. We also had uh, what has been a really tumultuous time as it relates to the contagion and COVID-19. And I think that that's created a huge amount of uncertainty, volatility, complexity, and ambiguity, what's called VUCA. Uh, and, and that's going to require, by all companies, big and small, careful management ahead. One of the things that I get to see and in some cases work on is um, helping organizations with their digital transformation. Everything's digital these days. You can't go uh, very far in business without at least asking the question, but in many cases investing significant sums of money uh, and time and talent, thinking about like how do we digitally transform our organization. And, and that digital transformation journey creates a massive opportunity for uh, organizations to deploy new technologies. And so thinking about that in the context of, you know, disaster proofing your organization is really important. Um, finally, and let me just advance the slides here. The other thing I would say is, you know, in my 20-year career, I had some early exposure 
when I was living and working in Europe um, with uh, scenario planning at Shell. And I think that that gave me a good foundation in terms of thinking about strategic processes and integrated planning within organizations, thinking about the future that was really, really important. As part of my research, um, one of the things that I looked at was a series of um, case studies as it, relate to, as it relates to informing the book. I think one of the most interesting case studies relates to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, back in October 2019, two months before the first recorded case of COVID-19 in Wuhan, um, this Washington-based uh, organization decided to study the impact of a global health pandemic. So think about it. This is before the pandemic happened. You had uh, a lot of very smart people uh, that pulled together um, CEOs and other leaders to start thinking about, well, what would happen in a global pa pandemic situation? And so they did a planning exercise, and they chose a fictional, novel, and highly transmiss transmittable coronavirus similar to you know SARS, MERS and other viruses that we've seen in the past um, and and they looked at that and they said okay let's get a team of experts and draw from fields of bioscience, global health, national security, emergency response and economic economics and let's stress test the ability of the US to respond to a global health uh, ca catastrophe. And so again, this was back in October 2019. Um, and when I looked at this case study, the parallels to what actually unfolded in 2020 were striking. Their scenario projected a 3.1% death rate. And as of August, when I was researching the book of 2020, the World Health Organization announced 3.4% reported had died. Their scenario assumed that governments would try to use short-term measures to slow the speed and spread, such as looking at travel bans, border closures, uh, and they predicted that a lot of that would not be successful uh, in, uh, in stopping the spread of the virus. In fact, you know, uh, what we've seen is a lot of these measured measures created mistrust uh, and, and damaged international cooperation. Uh, that is so necessary when you're combating a, a global pandemic like COVID-19. The fictional vi virus um, spread through international air travel. And in fact, that is what, is, what, what, what happened in 2020. Um, there's no symptoms for a period of time, increasing the likelihood of human-to-human -human transmission. They predicted that. That's what happened. And the experts working on the scenario model could see enormous economic and political problems and an overloaded healthcare system. And you think about what we've been reading this week in Brazil, where, uh, you know, it's very unfortunate their healthcare system is collapsing as we speak. So my point in sharing um, this, this case study from CSIS is I think the insights that came out of uh, this fictional but surprisingly real scenario exercise could have changed how the United States, had it been taken seriously, how the United States responded to the COVID-19 crisis. So I, I conclude this slide by saying scenarios, as used by CSIS and the foresight that they can bring, are very powerful tools to imagine a possible future however good or bad that might be. So the critical questions that, that I try to address uh, in my book um, really um, you know, come down to what I've, in terms of the setup there that I've, that I've given you to um, a set of critical questions. I think you know, what's most alarming is most people around the world, we didn't see it coming. We didn't see COVID-19 coming. Um, and if you go back in history, other similar disruptive forces that we've seen in history, often we don't see it coming. Hardly anyone predicted the global pandemic, and it shut down everything economically and socially. We didn't anticipate it. So few were prepared, and the results were now uh, living with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And so my book tries to really address a number of critical questions. You know, how does your business prepare for accelerating risk and uncertainty? How do you protect your business from the assaults that you can't see right now, but might happen in the future? How do you keep on top of massive volumes of information and data in the external world? Um, you know, the amount of data that we're creating on a daily basis is astronomical. I think the other question is, you know, have you stretched your strategic thinking and mental models when you're working through, you know, a strategic plan or a strategy or thinking about the future? Um, have you battle tested that in some way? Have you thought about the worst case scenario? And then the other question is, are leaders really truly thinking versus just doing and working through a framework? And I think, you know, what I try to uncover in the book is the importance of that thinking process, stretching your mental models. And has your strategy been properly stress tested and validated? So these are all important questions as you think about um, you know, where you're going to take your organization in the future, whether big or small. Uh, and, and scenarios offer a way to help you um, think about um, that future in a more structured, um, methodical, and stress-tested way. So what I want to do next is, for those that are on the call that might have less experience in this space, Talk about some of the, you know, the important basics when thinking about um, scenarios and, and explain that um, at its most fundamental level. So essentially, when you think about scenario planning, it's about complexity and uncertainty. It's about understanding that complexity, both internally within your organization and externally in the market you, you operate in. It's about thinking about multiple futures. I think some people get confused between scenarios and forecasting. We're not trying to forecast the future here. What we're trying to do is say, what are the multiple futures that could play out? And how do we react and adapt to those futures? It's also about thinking through scenarios at different levels. And whether you're CSIS and thinking about, you know, macro pandemic impacts to you're trying to make a very specific investment decision in your business, one of the beauties of thinking about scenarios and using scenarios is it can work at different levels in an organization. It's about mental models, and it's about stretching your mental models. I think as human beings, we have a tendency um, to go to what we're familiar with. And what scenarios can help you think about is, what are the boundaries of what could happen? What's the unexpected? What would we do if the unexpected happened? It's also about storytelling. And the most powerful scenarios that I've seen, it, have seen uh, in different organizations and been involved in are those where you can tell a very powerful story and engage not only leadership, but employees in your organization in that process. It's also about monitoring signposts. And, and what I mean by signposts is you might develop a series of scenarios that say, you know, A, B, or C might happen in the future world. And the signposts are the things that you want to monitor along the way that give you a signal as to whether a particular scenario is playing out or not. So at its most basic level, this is what scenario planning is all about. And I'll talk a little bit later in the presentation through you know, a very easy to apply framework that you can uh, use in, in your organization. Another example that I wanted to share which again, I think speaks to the power of scenarios, but unfortunately also speaks to the consequences if you ignore them, um, was a situation with uh, the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum um, teamed up with the Gates Foundation, as well as the John Hopkins University 
or Center for Health and Security. And they co-hosted an event called Event 201. And you can look Event 201 up online. Um, and they modeled uh, and, and basically ran a scenario planning exercise to simulate an outbreak of a novel coronavirus transmitted from bats to pigs. So again, sounds familiar. It was modeled after SARS outbreak in 2003 and 2004, but they decided to make it a much more transmissible version uh, involved, involving mild symptoms. And when they looked at the results of the fifth, uh, when I looked at the results of the fictional scenario, I was struck by two things. First, it was uncanny how accurately this group imagined the future. Um, and, and secondly, Event 201 was a model example of, of how I think, and from my experience, effective scenario planning should work and what it can do for businesses and governments um, in terms of helping think about the future. They did everything right. They involved a range of stakeholders, in this case, academics, business, government, healthcare sector workers. Um, the discussion took place in a workshop style format and the planners created a carefully cut crafted narrative for each scenario. Um, once the epidemic became established, you know, they said it, it would explode into a global pandemic, mainly because no one listened to the experts who were issuing the warnings. They said that at first, some countries seemed to control it, but eventually the virus continued to spread and there was no vaccine available in the first year. There would be major societal and economic consequences and a conviction that um, the worst of it could, be, could have been uh, avoided in the early going stages if there'd been political will to do that. They came up with some very specific recommendations from event 201. And so let me walk you through that. They said, global cooperation is essential, major gaps in preparedness, for example, a global shortage in masks need to be addressed. You need to make use of corporate capabilities since the public sector would soon be overwhelmed. So I think about Dyson, for example, making ventilators. Nations, international organizations, and global transportation companies should cooperate to ensure trade and travel can continue during the severe pandemic. They also said governments should provide more resources and support for surge manufacturing of vaccines. I think about what's going on in Europe and the UK right now. They said that businesses need to um, recognize the economic burden of the pandemic and lobby for stronger preparedness. And finally, they said governments in the private sector should assign a greater priority to com combating misinformation and disinformation. So I think about you know the five five G mobile signals that at one point in time, believe it or not, we were saying, or certain media organizations were saying that that transmits the virus. And so squashing that information very early on is really important. So their recommendations, um, I think, are um, really interesting and align with a lot of what we've seen. And look, this presentation is not just about COVID-19, because that happens to be the crisis, the disruption that we're dealing with right now. My point is that these examples offers clues as to, you know, the types of things that are going on that we in some way are ignoring and should be taking more seriously um, at any level of organization as we think about the future. So let's unpack complexity and uncertainty in uh, a little bit more detail. So, um, you know, when I think about complexity, it's really uh, at its most definitional level, uh, a measure of the total number of, of, of properties transmitted by an object and detected by an observer. And uncertainty is defined as doubt. And so, Complexity and uncertainty in organizations uh, is, is high right now because a, vari a variety of political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors that are at play. One of the things that I talk about in the book is what I call the eight big 
megatrends that are impacting the world. And so these break down into, um, you know, geopolitics. We think about, you know, Brexit, the last four years of, of Trump. Um, we think about all those things geopolitically that impact our world. And, and you think about some of the things that have been happening both here in Alberta and in, 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 in this country. The second thing, and I alluded to this earlier in terms of the technology piece and digital, is that you know, we are in the midst of major technology transformation. And that is reshaping all kinds of industries and sectors and how we live our lives. You know, Bill Gates' recent book on the climate crisis and climate change is another major existential threat that we are dealing with as humanity as we speak and will be a priority for the decades to come and is reshaping all kinds of organizations. You think about new human behaviors and how much time we spend on our phones and the technology that we use, behaviors have been transformed right in front of us. Another area is population growth and urbanization. The idea of megacities that include more than 10 million people, there are more megacities than there have ever been, and they're growing by the day. You know, we look, we will be at 10 billion people on the planet very, very soon. And most of those people will be living in big cities around the world. Agriculture and food by design, you know, you have 10 billion people we need to produce more food and we need to fi find out and, and reconfigure supply chain processes to support that. Think about food by design. The next area is around healthcare reimagined. How we get our healthcare in the future is being transformed right in front of us. And with an aging population, that creates all kinds of challenges, but also opportunities for companies. And finally, the last big mega trend is around resilient supply chains. And I think COVID-19 has taught us how important it is to um, think about those supply chains, maintain some of those uh, supply chains during a crisis. And so when you think about these eight mega trends impacting um, the world, organizations need to find ways to adapt um, and, and encourage, you know, ways of identifying the environment through perhaps scenarios and quickly making you know changes to strategy based on these trends businesses uh, need to be lance, resilient uh, yeah. lance i've got a quick question so uh in looking sure. at uh, the eight mega uh, trends that you've got uh on the slide right now uh would these be uh, for the audience, would these be the key trends that uh, you believe they should be considering as they embark on uh, scenario planning and thinking about what their industries and businesses will look like moving forward in the next few months or years uh, coming down? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, these are the big trends. I think I would say, Cal, you need to think about the macro trends, which are these, but you also need to think about maybe the specific micro trends that are happening in your market. And success is thinking through a combination of both. And in fact, one of the slides that I'll talk about later in terms of the process is the importance of actually spending the time thinking about the trends that are relevant to you. I'm talking about the big picture trends, but there might be other trends specific to your sector or organization that you need to consider as well. So this isn't the be-all and end-all for all, as it were. Right. Um, so let's talk about um, forecasting versus scenario planning. So one of the things that many people get mixed up in, in terms of thinking about scenarios, is they treat it as a forecasting exercise. And as I was sort of preparing for today, I wanted to kind of share um, a couple of key differences. And I'm, I'm generalizing here, but when you think about forecasting, you know, you, really you're thinking about uh, prediction of the future based on the historical past. And you're planning for one future. And you might have some sensitivity either side, which is 
um, you know, might be plus 10% or minus 15%, but it's one for future. And you're thinking about what's prob probable. And you're probably taking a very quantitative approach to that, that process. And you're not factoring in all those big risks, those big uncertainties, uh, but you're really um, more focusing on certainty. And you're, you're testing for accuracy. And you're involving financial planners and expert analysts. And you're, you're thinking more on a relative basis in terms of the short term. In terms of scenario planning, what you're trying to do here is think about processes to consider potential futures based on um, you know, multiple futures. Um, you're, you're also like planning for those multiple futures. You think about what's plausible. You're using qualitative and quantitative information. You're considering those risks and uncertainties. You might have more difficulty for testing for accuracy because this is not a fore forecasting process. And you're involving the CEO, top executives, maybe the chief strategy officer, if you have one, facilitators and consultants. You're taking a very long-term perspective. So what I want you to take away from this slide is, you know, and I, and I talk about this in a lot more detail in the book, is forecasting is about prediction of the future, and that is not what scenario planning is about. Scenario planning is more about a thinking process to consider potential futures and multiple potential futures as you go forward. And this illustration of these, um, these diagrams really uh, points to, you know, going from today to one future in terms of forecasting and going to today to multiple scenarios in terms of scenario planning. I've talked a little bit about stretching mental models, and I wanted to make just a few kind of comments here as we think about this. So, um, you know, it's this notion of convergent and divergent thinking. And I think we have a tendency, if I just sort of show you the slide here, of too quickly deciding what to do and converging on the action and convergent thinking. And, and what scenario planning is trying to encourage leaders and organizations to think about is exploring the possibilities, diverging your thinking, wallowing in the ambiguity, as I like to call it. You know, scenario making is about, you know, acute perception or, or better re-perception. It's becoming like free of those old perceptions and, 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 and thinking about those, um, those futures in a different way. It's a reliable way to create kind of divergent scenarios uh, and to picture the key uncertainties on an axis. And so eventually you need to converge and take action. So I'm not saying that that's not important. Success is a combination of the left-hand side and the right-hand side working together. But I would encourage you in your organizations when you're having those strategic discussions not to get too quickly to the right but to wallow in the ambiguity on the left. The other thing that I've talked about a little bit um, in this presentation is the power of storytelling. Um, one of the great quotes that I like is um, from um, someone that I had the opportunity to spend some time with. Jennifer Arker is a, a professor at Stanford, and she has written a book, The Power of, of Story. And, um, you know, scenarios, if done well, uh, can be used to tell different stories about potential futures. And if you can do that in a compelling way, you're going to get more enthusiasm and energy from the organizations and the leaders involved. You know, and storytellers take all the facts, the details, and they use that to formulate scenarios and turn them into something that's compelling. Something's going to compel the leaders and the employees and the investors to buy in. So my message to all of you is wherever possible, it's advantageous to explain that message through stories. Um, and that will affect to be more effective in unblocking employee energy. And those stories need to be simple. They need to be easy to understand. They need to be compelling. And they'll have a much greater impact on the organizations. And so when I think about the power of story, um, you know, a couple of things to, um, 
flag here in terms of you know thinking about reliability leaders need to be able to you know connect with the story and see how it's relevant to their industry be able to immerse the readers to put them be able to help them put themselves and the organization into the story there needs to be a bit of drama it needs to be credible in some way it needs to be familiar and relevant and 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 simple to understand as well and so as you develop these narratives about potential futures when developing scenarios think about these six components that make up a powerful story so the next question you might ask is okay i'm a medium sized company um i've heard a lot about large companies using this process um you know how 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 can i apply it and it's pretty straightforward um you know there's a set of tightly integrated steps starting with defining the scope the time frame and the key stakeholders that you want to involve in this strategic dialogue so that's step 1 step 2 is okay let's spend some time exploring the environment and to your point cal you know this is where you start to sort of think about some of those big macro and micro trends that impact our business right you then spend time analyzing those trends those risks and those uncertainties to say well what would it mean what what's important what's the prioritization of these risks these trends uncertainties what do we care most of, about given you know the sector that we're working in you then off the back of that build the scenarios and the signposts that are important to you and use the power of story and all the other things that I've talked about right then you confirm those scenarios and say okay if we look at our strategic plan as an organization what would we do in scenario a in scenario b and scenario c what foundations of our strategy stay the same or what things would we tweak or fundamentally change if that scenario played out and this is what i'm talking about the importance of being prepared to build that resilience and those shock absorbers in your organization And then really the final final step in this process is 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 monitoring the signposts and executing those strategies. So now, you know, you've gone through the process. It's important to say, okay, what are we going to keep an eye on that's important to our business that if we see a major shift on that signpost, we need to kind of reflect on our strategy and maybe make a change. Cal, you look like you uh you put your camera back on, so Um I'm wondering if you're going to jump in there. Yeah, yeah, I was I was going to say um uh, you know I, I I always love um you know process, right? Just being a process oriented person and and, and a question that that uh, we just received is um how like in looking at this framework, can you run us possibly through an example like a mental example of a medium or a small size company taking this and and running through that so it, so it comes to life to them and and they can start applying uh this approach yeah for sure so you know an example that i can think of which uh is for a company here in alberta pretty small uh was a oil field service um uh lodging company and um eff- effectively they provide camps and logistics for the oil and gas market and so they stepped through this same process and we were involved in that process but like first step was okay let's agree some of the key people that need to be involved in this discussion it was a pretty small group of less than i think it was less than 10 people uh, we had a series of workshops where um you know we would involve those key stakeholders some advanced research was done to say you know what are the key trends uh we effectively explored the environment and then based on that exploration that was done what what are um those key trends risks and uncertainties that we care the most about and we identified those for the camps and logistics part of you know the oil field service sector we then used that to build 
um, three scenarios for this particular organization and a set of things that we needed to monitor that are important for camps and logistics. For example, you know, investment in capital is critical because if the oil and gas industry is investing in capital, it means that they're building pipelines, building facilities, so they need camps to support that. So monitoring the amount of capital that their customers are spending is a key signpost. You know, they looked at their strategy and they said, okay, if these different scenarios play out, high capital, low capital, as an example, what are we going to do? How will we pivot our strategies to support that, right? And then, then it's putting it into action, monitoring and pivoting our strategy as we go and making small changes so that, that we don't have to make some big disruptive change later, although that might be unavoidable, Cal. So that's just one example. And you know, another example I've seen an emergency response company uh, that provides helicopter emergency response and other emergency services go through, a, and this is a non-for-profit, go through a very similar situation. So this is not just for small, uh, for large companies, but this can be applied to small co companies. You know, I was recently involved with a municipal organization where we use scenarios very specifically for program level investment decisions. So it was a micro case within a big complex organization where we were using it within that organization to help us think through options, right? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's awesome. And I and really appreciate you sharing that uh, more in details, Lance, because uh, to me, it's, you know, it, it, I'd say the entire process is super important, but I always find the anchors are that first step of defining spo uh, scope and identifying who are the right people that you want on the table, right? Like within your organization, even pulling in folks externally for that subject matter expertise. And, and then that final step, which is six, it's, you know, we have scenarios, we've developed plans, we're, we're going to do different things. But if we're not monitoring these key signposts and, uh, and the strategies that we're executing, we, the whole work goes to almost goes to waste, like I would say, right? Like, you know, those, those to me feel really foundational and it's kind of nice to hear that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me skip, um, let me skip forward the British Airways example and, and talk a little bit about some of the benefits. So as I was researching um, for the book, um, you know, one of the things that struck me is just the myriad of many benefits that come from thinking in this way. And, and those benefits can be split into um, what I call input benefits. And, and that's really around risk management. So understanding, you know, your short-term, your long-term risks, ranking those risks, and understanding your mitigation plans for those risks. But also in terms of assessing um, in some way uncertainty, um, that's a key force. And anticipation and becoming a more intelligent organization that can uh, understand that uncertainty and what it means is a very powerful capability to have. And there are a set of process benefits as well. And so thinking about educational learning or organizational learning and, and creating that continuous learning culture within your organization where you understand the causal relationships, you're able to anticipate things that happen, um, and you're collaborating and teaming in a different way is also a benefit. We've talked a lot about option analysis. So thinking through strategic options, diversification, investment, scenarios can help stretch your thinking around like what would we do if A happened or if, if B happened or C happened? And then we've talked a lot about strategy validation and stress testing in terms of if you can you know, do this, you're going to be, uh, become a more resilient company. And so thinking about you know, your competitive assets, your core capabilities, um, and doing that in an iterative way is a key benefit. And then the final set of benefits are what I call output benefits. So scenario planning done well helps you think through complex decisions. You know, you're trying to make decisions around how you allocate capital, what investments you make, where you might cut costs, you know, the strategic moves, both organic and inorganic that you make, and scenarios can help you with that. It makes you more nimble. 
I find a lot of organizations think very statically about their strategy. And what I would advocate for is much more flexible strategies where it's not a linear process where you sort of define your vision, your mission, and say, we're going to go from point A to point B. Because you know what? Along that journey from A to B, there's going to be a lot of things that are thrown at you. And so how do you pivot along the way and be ready for that and more nimble? And finally, innovation. So I've seen situations where, you know, scenario planning helps companies think in a very innovative way. And in fact, you know, one of those examples here in Canada is the Port of Vancouver. So the Port of Vancouver went through um, a few years ago an initiative that they refer to as Port 2050. And it was all around thinking about the Port of Vancouver and what it would look like long term in the future. So they ran a series of in-depth interviews uh, with the port leadership and staff and other experts. They ran a big workshop with 70 participants to gather input and advice. And they drafted a set of scenarios, key drivers of change, and developed those based on those interviews and that workshop input and a bunch of research that they did. And so one of the scenarios that they developed in Vancouver was called the Great Transition. And it was deemed to be the one that the port believes worth, is worth aspiring to. And effectively, um, what the great transition talks about is the, the, the move to decarbonization. And as a result, through innovative thinking, port, the Port of Vancouver struck a partnership with BC Hydro to focus on one of the scenarios by creating an energy action initiative to advance energy conservation. And so I think it's a great example, and you can read about this on the internet, um, of using scenarios to kind of drive that creative thinking as it relates to your business strategy. Uh, Lance, I've got another uh, question that kind of came in. Um, you talked about scenario planning, uh, and, and this is a question from Leanne. So do you consider scenario planning as a component of strategic planning? Uh, you know, why or why not? And, and if so, how do the two work together? Yeah, um, it, that's, a, that's a great question um, there. And I, I wish I had a slide that we took out, Cal, around <laughs> how scenario planning fits in the broader strategic processes. And uh, if you buy my book, uh, plug for my book there, um, there is a, a, a whole section in a chapter that talks about this. But effectively, scenarios is really sort of working at that strategic planning, business planning level to help f feed ideas and a thought process as you're considering the options and the future strategy. It's less about informing budgeting and the forecasting process, because that's why we have budgets and forecasts. So I always think of it as this sort of, um, you know, provocateur uh, type process that challenges your thinking when you're thinking about strategy and strategic planning. But yeah, great, great, great question. What I wanted to talk about next is just some of the key roles uh, when thinking about um, scenario planning. So, you know, the CEO clearly plays a, a great role. If the CEO is not bought into this process, um, you aren't going to have uh, a, a, a lot of success. But I think if your organization has someone that is in charge of strategy, and that might be the CEO as well, depending on how small you are, the strategy person has a key role to play here as well. The strategy person in your organization is that provocateur, challenges the thinking of the executive team, of the key managers in the organization. And then the final role is the scenario planners themselves. Um, you might have analysts that do this. You might call them analysts. You might call them planners. It doesn't really matter. But these are the people that are going to do the work, do the research, uncover the insights, prepare the information so that you can have a really rich dialogue, you know, when you go into that, uh, that meeting and that discussion. 
So just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on and and really kind of uh, wrap up here uh, with a few, I think, important uh, concluding comments. So if you if you look at, and I love this quote, by the way, by, by John Cotter, he's a professor at Harvard, um, like, change is not slowing down. Um, competition is more rife than ever. We're dealing with a lot of uncertainty right now. And if we look over the last 50 years of business and society, it's clear to me that um, change is constant. And leaders of organizations are dealing with a myriad of changes, many of them new in this rapidly um, evolving world. And we have these periods of you know, relative calm and stability, but they're inevitably interrupted by periods of massive shock and disruption. And these shocks send re reverberations through all aspects of how we live our lives and how we do business. And so you think about um, a timeline, you go back to the 70s and you think about the OPEC oil price shock you think about the 80s, the Latin American sovereign debt crisis, uh, the tequila crisis in the 90s, where Mexico was in big trouble and needed to be bailed out by the Americans, dot-com bubble in 2000, the economic crisis in 2008, the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. So, you know, as you see on this slide, like periods of calm are... Um, interrupted and disrupted by periods of massive volatility and uncertainty. And we've seen that played out. And so this keeps happening. My point in the book is, you know, how do you better prepare yourself to be, you know, in some ways, disaster proof? I'll pause there, Cal, because it looks like you're, uh, you're about to jump in. Go yeah, ahead. no, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm getting uh, a lot of questions, Lance. So, um, you know, do we want to go through uh, a couple more slides or, or you know? We'll yeah, this is really kind of decide. Slide. Yeah? So, yeah, maybe I'll just conclude with a few comments and then we can open it up to questions. Totally. So, you know, my, my point on this slide is that the only real question is when will the next crisis occur? How much of an impact will it have? And are you disaster proof? And so as I reflect on these various crises, and I talk about these in more detail in the book over the last 50 years, you cannot ignore the possibility that history does repeat itself. You know, we, we enter into one kind of crisis or another approximately every decade. And maybe that's going to accelerate. I don't have a crystal ball. But there is something about what makes markets and the wider systems that we operate in that Tends to, we tend to see this sort of this boom followed by a bust. And we've seen that, you know, particularly in Calgary over the last several decades. And this is creating all kinds of challenges for organizations to predict and to prepare for this uncertainty. You know, those boom periods, we love those investment, growth, employment, consumption, um, excess, followed by, you know, the bust. Um, austerity, unemployment, investment cuts, bailouts, new regulation. So why are we not learning from this? And so I would conclude by saying, you know, success when you use something like scenario planning or any strategic tool is the ability to help an organization develop those shock absorbers to deal with the next bust while at the same time preparing for the next boom thinking through those options, both good or bad, seeing around the corner and understand like what could happen next, seeking those best opportunities, wisely investing, building the right portfolio and the capabilities and avoiding complacency. It's about being prepared, resilient, open, innovative, creative, curious, and ready for change. It's about changing an organization's comfort level and assumptions, stretching mental models, and expanding the boundaries of existing strategies and considering new options. And I would conclude by saying, and then I think we'll open it up, we can never predict exactly what will happen in the future. We'll always be surprised by the unexpected. 
But scenario planning represents an approach that will help us plan and prepare. And I think it's worth the investment of time, talent, and treasury. So with that, I will, uh, I will hand it to you, Cal, for questions. Yeah, awesome. No, thanks, Lance. And I, I can definitely relate to the boom and bust comment because I, I just feel like living in Calgary over the last few years, my stress levels, you know, are super high and then they go down, then they go up and then they're back down. Uh, but, um, you know, in, in relation to scenario planning, oftentimes it is associated with large complex organizations that have a lot of resources like, you know, scenario analysts, CSOs and so on. But, uh, you know, how can organizations like small and medium sized uh, enterprises take this framework and, uh, and apply it uh, to, to, to themselves, like what's an easy way that it isn't really bogged down that, um, you know, say uh, a gelato maker or a phone booth manufacturer or uh, and so on can can take on and apply within their context. Yeah, no, great, great question. And, you know, an example that comes to mind, I sit on, um, I sit on the, you still there, Cal? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something something, something happened with my thing there. Um, yeah, so a great example of this is I, I sit on a, a non-for-profit board uh, for the Canadian Energy Climate Nexus. And what we're looking at is the, the nexus of, um, you know, the energy industry uh, and climate change and all the challenges around that. So non-for-profit, it's a very small, nimble organization uh, run by great CEO. And, um, you know, when I was talking to David, we talked about the application of this type of thinking to this organization, which is, you know, this is less than 10 people. And um, this doesn't need to be like the Port of Vancouver, where they ran a process with 70 stakeholders and all kinds of ca complexities. We're applying it to a non for profit that's 10 people. We're going to run a workshop in an afternoon where we're going to rapidly progress through, you know, scoping a problem that we want to solve, exploring that problem in more detail uh, through understanding of key trends, market dynamics. We're not going to do a bunch of research. We're going to just use the knowledge and the brains of the people in the room. We're going to analyze that, prioritize it, build a set of simple scenarios that map the future. And then we're going to stress test it against David's strategy to say, you know, do we think that the strategy is robust enough, able to pivot? And that's a five hour conversation. So you can be like Rolls Royce or British Airways and run a multi month process, or you can be like CCN in this case and run a five hour dialogue and everything in between. So, you know, to answer your question, Cal, it's very scalable to all kinds of levels. And uh, you do not need to make this complicated. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, no, I, I love that because uh, oftentimes we try to walk in and try to make strategic decisions with uh, so much information and, and analysis that you end up in analysis paralysis. But you've just given us an example of how we can, you know, if we need to do it, we can just get into a room and use the knowledge that we've got already amassed in our heads and just start running scenarios and coming up with these priority list that we need to then stress test against our current game plan to ensure that, you know, we have these buffers and we're building these things uh, as part of our plan forward. Um, a couple of questions also came up. They, they might be, uh, they're probably more tactical, uh, but, you know, I, I'd love to kind of ask you these. So, so one from, from Stanley is how often would you recommend companies or organizations carry out scenario planning? Yeah, Stanley, it's a, it's a good question again. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's no right or wrong answer. I think it really depends a little bit on your organization. Although what I would say, and I talk about this in, in the book, it's important to keep your scenarios fresh because the world around you changes, your context changes. And so, you know, does that mean you need to refresh the strategy of uh, the scenarios um, every few years? Probably at least. Should you be doing it? like every month? Likely not. Maybe once a year is too frequent, but 
but it should be a regular rhythm within your organization where you're keeping these scenarios fresh and up to date um, so that they, you know, reflect the reality that you live in. Like governments change, you know, we may end up with a conservative federal government in this country uh, in the next election cycle. That changes a lot of things for businesses. We may end up with an NDP government based on current polls, although I'm not predicting either way, an NDP government in Alberta. That changes a bunch of stuff for many small, medium and large companies. So I think reflecting some of those key macro forces and keeping those kind of fresh every few years is important. Yeah, no, appreciate that, Lance. Uh, another question that pro might build on this is um, like, what is the size of materiality of scenarios that should be applied in scenario planning? Are they big events like COVID-19, earthquakes, giant disasters, or should we, you know, should we look at uh, supply shortages for a specific ingredient or a, or a part that we need to develop, uh, you know, if we're manufacturing cars? Like, where do we draw that line and how specific do we get, or is it purely macro? Yeah, it, it, so one of the chapters in the book, um, and, the, and it's the entire chapter, talks about scenario planning at different levels. So the macro level right the way down to you might be trying to make an investment decision that's really material and really important to your business. And so you can apply scenarios to thinking about that investment decision and everything in between. So don't think of this as this is just the big COVID-19 economic crisis, you know, oil price drop, what have you. It can be that. And that can be very powerful and is very powerful, but it can be very specific to we are making a major investment decision and we want to play out different scenarios in terms of what this means. Totally. Um, uh, here's, uh, here's one more. Um, and so I know the book isn't out yet. Um, can, you, can you tell us when it's going to be out? So, so that's one, I don't think we talked about it yet, but also a question from the crowd from Sabrina is, why are we only hearing about scenario planning now? And, and, and when did this fall off the priority list amongst executives and why? Yeah, okay, so in terms of, um, maybe I'll, I'll address the first, yeah. uh, the second yeah, time. Like, the book's coming out and we've got this question. Yeah. So I thought I'd ask the yeah, like same time. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting when you when I was doing the research for the book, you go back and and you look what happened right after nine eleven. There was this massive surge of use of scenario planning, and then we we kind of forgot about it. And so I think, Sabrina, that the the issue is um, we suffer from memory loss. We we get comfortable in the situation that we're in. And a few years after a major crisis, we forget about what happened two years ago or what happened five years ago, and, and we get into this comfort zone. And, and I think that what I'm advocating right now, having just come out of a COVID-19 crisis, which is why this book is getting released right now, is it's important right now um, as we suffer from you know, the immediate effects of COVID-19. But let's not forget about it as we go forward. And this should be an active tool that we use going forward. And leadership teams should, you know, continue to challenge themselves to use it. And then that brings me to the second part of, of, of your question there, Cal, just in terms of the book. So um, it is available for pre-order for corporate orders. So reach out through Cal, um, and, uh, and he'll put you in touch with me if you want to do corporate orders, which is a minimum of 20 books. Otherwise, you can pre-order it online, um, and it's on um, all the major platforms. So you can buy it on Amazon, Indigo, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, eBook, uh, and you can pre-order it now. Uh, publication date is the 20th of April, so you won't get it until uh, after the publication date, but you can certainly order it online now you do want to get it earlier and you do want to get a bit of a discount and you do want to um, order it through me, get in contact with uh, 
with Cal and we can uh, help you out with, uh, with that. And then I think Cal, some yeah. of your, uh, some of your yeah. participants are going to get a copy of the book. So I don't know if you want to talk totally. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to share that, uh, you know, uh, courtesy of Alberta innovates, uh, 10, uh, individuals who are attending today's event are going to be receiving copies of Lance's book, uh, disaster proof. So, um, so I know we're at the top of the hour. So, you know, amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Lance, from myself and everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, scenario planning is a key capability for leading organizations, and it was great to get your perspectives on scenario planning and how we can incorporate it into our operating models. Uh, a couple of things that I want to close out on is, uh, you know, if you've missed a portion of today's talk, want to revisit it, explore our other pre previous topics, or learn more about the Growth Catalyst program, visit our website at www.growthcatalyst.ca. We are recruiting for our next cohort. These keynotes are also available on Alberta Innovates' YouTube channel. Uh, and then our next and final edition of the speaker series is on March 30th with Max Valiket, well, he, where he'll be speaking on growth through brand and purpose. Uh, finally, again, thank you, Lance. Uh, really appreciated your time today. You know, the growth, and, uh, the growth and Resiliency Speaker Series was brought to you today by Mount Royal University's Growth Catalyst Program in collaboration with Alberta Innovates. The Speaker Series is also supported by the Government of Canada as part of the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lance, and uh, have a great afternoon.